Boom. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We have an epic guest that is returning for his second show with us, David Savage. Hello, my friends. Thank you for coming back on the show. Good to be back. This is the first time I've been on something twice. Yes. It's a milestone. Yes. <laughs> you must have enjoyed our first time together. I did. That's what I figured out from this invitation. Yes. <laughs> yes. David's like, I'm in San Francisco doing these events, and I saw it in his email blast, and I was like, come do another show with us. Happy to be here. Yes. And it was episode 114. For those that want to go back, the link's in the bio. Um, Dave, this episode is called The Empath Returns, because that episode was called The Empath. And... Uh, an empath means that you feel other people's feelings. That's how I use the word. Yes, yes, and I would agree that that is a really great way, great definition. And you've been up to some good moves. You get some links in the bio as well to check out, but you have now, so besides doing your live workshops, these events that you perform at, um, actually doing live demonstrations where you tap into how someone else is feeling, now there is a Kickstarter going on for a play that you're doing in New York. You got it. Which is exciting. And you have a, what's your friend's name that's the director? Katie Davis. Katie Davis, cool. And it's like on 36th Street, right? It is, a beautiful theater called Theater Lab on 36th between 8th and 9th, right around there. And Ron, you want to pull the NDI up? And um, we have a nice, uh, we, have a, we, have a, we have your Kickstarter up here, but specifically the image there, that's it right there. Yep. That's the beautiful location. I love that's it. That's it. Yeah. yeah, so in April, I, uh, Katie and I did three workshop performances of this play, which I'm calling Empath, uh, to test it out, get feedback, see how it went. And we sold out, this was one of the three shows, we sold out all three performances. People really liked it. And they also gave us some really good feedback that we're integrating now. Uh, and the theater was happy with it and they invited us back. Yes. Um, good. But we need some, some help making Financial this production backing. as big and beautiful as it wants to be. And $8,000 is such a small goal for uh, play. You know, this is, it is a small goal, but it will be achieved. We got 21 days to go. Okay. We'll be making a donation oh, later thank today. You. Yes. And it's From just a even quarter a, of the way, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, the small donations are what you know what gets the avalanche effect going. People mm. sharing it on social media, that kind of stuff. Hopefully, we can help David out here with the program. Please. And all right, so this is going on. Uh, also, the live workshops are still happening at the same time. You just did consciousness just, hacking here yeah, in San Francisco. Yeah, I, I did, I did conscious, I did an event with consciousness hacking just last night. Um, Mikey Siegel, uh, asked me to do it. Um, and I had a blast of maybe 80 people there. Nice. And I taught people who didn't even know such a phenomenon existed, that it was possible to feel other people's feelings or that we are already often feeling other people's feelings. Yeah. And we experimented with that. Uh, and then I showed them how I do it. So here's the advanced version for you to um, wonder at, but don't think it's inaccessible to you. It's totally accessible to you. It's just a process. And here's step one or step two along that, along that process. So that was, the, that was the workshop yesterday. And then, um, on Saturday, this coming Saturday, I'm doing an event called Ask the Empath, where I'll be fielding questions from whoever wants to ask me something in, a, uh, in, a, in a, my friend Rachel's home. And we only have a few tickets left, but if you're watching this and you wanna ask me whatever you want, come to Ask the Empath. Uh, you can find it on my website, empathnyc, empath.nyc. And that's the one that I went to last time. Yeah. Yeah, Rachel. Um, Rachel, yeah. Yeah, she has a beautiful home in Noe Valley and hosted like what, 30, 40 people the last time and it was super fun. Um, I met a lot of really cool people there too, yeah. And then, but my, my primary focus is, uh, you're watching the Kickstarter for it, my primary focus is this, is this play. Um, after these events, I'm doing one or two small things in New York. 
Uh, but I'm doing them largely pr to promote this play, to raise money for it, and then to get butts in the seats yep. uh, starting on November 29th. And this is the thing I am most excited about and is where I'm putting the bulk of my energy through this year. November 29th until when is it going to run? Uh, December 9th. December it's 9th. Two, two weeks in a row, four performances each week. Wow. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, two weeks in a row. Awesome. Starting this November 29th. Awesome. That'll be really fun. And then posting that and fil filming that, posting it. Are you going to take different audience members in? Yeah. So, Which, so every show will be different. Every then. show will be different. All eight shows will be different. I love that. Uh, so it's two pieces to the show. The first is me telling, not telling, enacting and showing my story of who I was before this all fell on me and how it all fell on me and how I went with it, fought it, went with it, and accepted it. Uh, and then at the end of the show, I will pull people from the audience and invite them to sit in front of me and do readings with them. Uh, and then maybe open it up even beyond whoever sits with me into some kind of group feeling, yeah. which I'll improvise on the spot. So it's a combination of storytelling and improvisational empathic readings yes in a genre of theater uh, i feel like katie and i are creating you from are scratch. immersive interactive theater psychic intuitive yeah. theater <laughs> with the conventional elements so you can just if you just like watching a play where a story happens you will be satisfied yeah and if you like watching stuff where you don't know what's going to happen next and this is really weird and it's going to get awkward you will be satisfied and if you're intrigued at the combination of the two, you will really enjoy yourself. And I am intrigued at the combination of the two. I love that. I am too. Psychic, intuitive. Yeah, well, I guess. So I want, to, I want to talk about this because I think, I think this is a really good starting point for what our discussion is, where it's going to go. So like you said that just happened at consciousness hacking there was a a realization from some people that was like not only can people go to the depths of feeling what someone else is feeling at this crazy level that you do but then there's also the very like intro level 101 which is like when someone is yelling what do i feel when they're yelling hmm. so that's like kind of like 101 maybe or when someone is laughing uncontrollably what do i feel yeah, maybe that's 102. 101, 101 is, yeah. would just be, what am I feeling right now? Period. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think most people would say, what am I feeling right now? The answer most people would give if asked on the spot is either, I don't know how I'm feeling right now, or a story they have in their head about how they're feeling right now, which may or may not reflect what they're actually feeling. Mm-hmm. So I'm feeling good, says the person who wants to be feeling good, but in actuality, I'm feeling good is covering an anxiety that you can see right there. So yeah. they're not actually feeling good, they're feeling anxious or, or tense. Or if you wanted to get more specific, they're feeling a, 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 a feeling of being pulled uh, tight from inside behind their chest. And that's how they're feeling when they say, I'm feeling good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, That's the, those are common. Those are common responses. Yeah, and that is 101. Is <clears throat> so I like how we're laying this out. And this is Ron. This is where I would love to get used to using a whiteboard on the show somehow, so that we could start showing things on a screen, or maybe like we can just start live illustrating with like a tablet or something. We'll get do used it in the this. air, and then <laughs> yeah, animate yeah. later. Yeah, yeah. So okay. So on one side we have 101. It's just being able to tune into our own feelings in the moment, feel how we feel to the most accurate levels that we can. Or as, well, that would be 102 accuracy, almost just uh -huh. like, okay. uh, I don't even want to give people that high a standard. <laughs> just literally, how am I feeling right now? Close your eyes, and then however you're feeling at that moment, you don't need words for it. Just that physiological experience you're having in your body at that moment is 101. And even if the answer to that question is, I have no idea how I'm feeling, I feel nothing, then that void or that blankness is the feeling you're feeling. We accept that you have now passed class 101 uh -huh. because you've closed your eyes, tuned in, felt nothing, and acknowledged it. 
Okay, so it's just a first physiological feeling without putting words on it. Oh, then yes. The second, 101. 101, 102 is getting more accurate. Temperature. Should we, should we take it a step at a time or you want to keep going fast? If we go fast, we're going to move, lose, lose some stuff. But if we go slow, let's go slow. It's gonna, this, it's is, gonna, this is it's exciting. Gonna, it could drag out a little bit. Let's go decide. slow with a kick and then so that we can get to these other pressing issues. Okay, slow okay. with a kick. So 102 is, is tapping into the physiological feeling and then maybe being able to get more and more accurate. Yes, uh, level of nuance. So at 102, mm -hmm. we don't settle for I feel nothing anymore. We patiently await for an actual experience to arise, mm. and we start observing the qualities of that experience. We're still not putting words on it, or if we are putting words on it, we're saying words like tingling, pressure, temperature, flow, urge, impulse, pulsation, the subtle experiences of being in one's own body. And those are just my words. There are a billion better ones. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're, I'm feeling the way my voice subtly echoes inside my chest. What is that little fluctuation? I'm feeling how my voice comes out through my throat, out into the air. That has a vibration. I can feel it. There's a tingling under my nose. There's a little bit of pressure in my chest. You know, and I could go on and on at infinitum. Totally. Now we're at 102 where totally. I'm actually having uh, subtle experiences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in my body that I'm able to I like that take a mental note of and I wonder if 10 if that might be 103 because 102 might be at, uh, being able to see like when someone else is giggling with joy or when they're super angry and then being like what is that energy doing to me yeah that'd be like 10 you think that's 103 that you think that's maybe we can start okay. put, putting that in, okay. in, in. You think that's past? Maybe yeah. that's two. Maybe now we're we're out we're out of the uh, we're out of the ones uh, out of the ones into okay. the into the intermediate. So, so two o one is then being able to take the first bits of energy from other people. Two o one would be noticing shifts in your physiology based on internal external experiences. One of the primary external experiences that's going to shift your physiology is going to be other people. But you could also notice a shift in your physiology as you step into a room or you walk outside yes. or, oh, well, how is that changing me internally? Let's give an example quick. It's like when you walk into a rambunctious bar and yeah. it's just like music is playing, people are talking, there's a thousand voices going on. And then the other one is when you just walk through the park and there's just birds chirping and there's trees and there's animals and it's all you hear is that. Those Total are, different. Those are great. So the first one, a lot of people, well, not all people, but a lot of people walking to that bar will feel something in them clench up. I'll be one of them. Some of the people will be opened up. So by definition, your physiological experience is going to be different than anybody else's, and that's cool. We're talking about the specificity of your experience, but mm -hmm. most people walking in out of nowhere into a loud, intense bar experience will clench up. Something in them retreats, even if they're not conscious of it. And then most people walking through a park, something in them, including me, loosens. Mm -hmm. There's a spaciousness, and this is not conceptual spaciousness. This is actual feeling of one's aura expanding. That's real. So now I'm feeling it. I can imagine it too. Calling in the idea encourages the experience too. So now, mm -hmm. ah, okay. And now maybe we can get to 102, 202, 202. 202, where, oh, being around you shifts me in some way. Now 202 gets complicated because am I shifting because something in you triggers something in me? Not necessarily in a negative sense. I like you. I'm drawn to you. I'm curious. Trigger some kind of curiosity, desire to interact. That has a physiological component. I'm leaning in, maybe. Or am I affected by something about you that isn't necessarily triggering in me an emotional reaction, but is your energy itself is permeating through me? And now I'm feeling you, and I'm, we're, we're syncing up on some level where your energy is meeting my energy, I'm taking on some of your energy. And that's a different kind of shift. And that's the place where I've been carving out a little bit of a home uh, in the cultural landscape, saying, well, that moment where somebody else's emotionality, physiology, 
vibration, energy, whatever language you want to put on it, affects me in subtle ways that are meaningful and demonstrate that we are all interconnected, woven together through these fields. Okay, let's throw, let's throw this on. You'll see what I've been doing. Ron's going to throw it on the screen. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So we have feeling our own physiology, feeling our own physiology with more accuracy. Yes. And then to... I would say with subtlety. With subtlety? Yeah. Subtlety. And then... Noticing shifts based on changes that are in the external world. Shifts in our physiology. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Inner experience probably could go beyond physiology and into, oh, when I go into a park, I have these kinds of thoughts. I wouldn't call that necessarily physiology. That's probably, that's just as valid. But so physiology have, is a good word too. The example given would be uh, feeling bar, calmer how in you, a park. How you feel walking into a bar versus walking into a park. That's great. Okay. Making it up as we go. Yeah. We should sell the class. Um, <laughs> this, this class, this class is, is on how to feel, <laughs> uh, which is kind of cool if you think about it. I mean, that's what we're learning all the time, but nobody ever taught us. So maybe it's cool to make it into a, a, a class. Um, let's get, let's get Salesforce as a sponsor for this class. Mark Benioff's been very generous with his partnerships and sponsorships. Yeah. Anyone out there that's watching from Salesforce, please I think there's, you know, if you us. think about how much feeling is our whole experience and how little we think about it, it's kind of amazing. I mean, we think about thinking all the time, all the time, how much thought is given to thought, a lot more than how much thought or attention is given to feeling, even though feeling is our primary mode of experiencing the world. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right, <laughs> that's right. So 202 would be... I think that might have to be because of the amount of logic that we have to use to maneuver the world. We're born into mm. the societal pressures that cause us to need to use logic more, whereas if we were enabled as a child to use more of our feeling or intuition and have society that enabled the use of that more, then that's how we could, that's how, that's going to be talked about in this transition we, period. We got, we got, we got, um, we got thrown off course at some point because we got hurt. And then instead of dealing with the hurt, we found that there was a way to simultaneously avoid feeling hurt and to do things that looked productive. <laughs> uh, and those two um, tendencies colluded to create all the machinery of modern life. And now maybe we're starting, or those of us who are in this Western modern paradigm are starting to realize, oops, maybe we can go back to the, to the source, the feeling space. And yep. then eventually into class 202, which is what I've been teaching, which is how we are shifted by other people, how our experience is shifted by other people. Interesting. Okay, so how our experience is shifted by other people. So this can be maybe like example given how you feel when someone is laughing or sure. angry. Great. Okay. And then now is there a 30 what would be like 301? Uh now we go we leave the realm of passively noticing our own experience and in class three um, we start playing with it deliberately so how to mm -hmm. deliberately open ourselves up to these kinds of experiences safely mm -hmm. or how to deal with experiences that we've had that we don't want to have in the future how to, how to work with this ability deliberately. Yeah, how to work with this ability how to, deliberately. How to deliberately and safely open ourselves up 
to these experiences. Come yes, up, and, and yeah, work with this ability. Yep, that's yeah. People often want to skip to class three hundred one. Yeah. Uh, me too. Everyone wants to know how to do something, but the building blocks are always crucial. Everything before then. You so. don't just go onto the court and start shooting three pointers. You don't just go and start closing million dollar <laughs> deals. You got to close those ten dollar deals. Yeah. So literally going, how am I feeling r right now? And even if the answer is I have no idea, literally, but I've tried to feel something. You've now passed class one hundred one, and you, um, we can build from there into oh, wow, I'm deliberately opening myself up to this person's energy. I'm understanding how it affects me. And then maybe in class 302, um, I'm using what I'm getting to help others consciously. We're doing it all the time unconsciously, but now we can start doing it consciously. Yeah. Okay, so, so 302, once you start deliberately and safely working with the ability, then you start feeling how to help with yep. this yep. ability. Yep. Okay. So then this would also be maybe, <clears throat> this is a big, a big part of this in my opinion, at least from the very small amount of intuitive practice that I've had with this, is that I, it's really important for me to know when I am doing a process that is energetically exhausting for me, taking on someone else's uh, experience with trauma or taking on their, uh, their the the path the path of growth for them the integration of the trauma and the growth because that that requires me to hold space and all that so so again when you're working with this process it, it's probably one of the most important things to understand how you're feeling throughout it because it can be extremely exhausting the most important thing to understand uh, how you yourself are feeling is the is the foundation of I want to say it's the foundation of all growth. Mm. Mm. It doesn't mean you have to be conscious of it all the time. I don't want to put that pressure on people. But if there's another way to grow into who you really are that doesn't involve feeling what you're actually feeling, I don't know it. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's, my, that's the limitation of my own worldview um, or either that or I'm just right and there is there is this pathway that's open to all of us that few of us take where we grow through our own experience and much of our own experience is 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 the felt sense uh, but we can broaden that it's not just what you're feeling it can also be what you're hearing and seeing and what's coming through you but having a reference point for how everything that's showing up feels in your body feels so crucial. Um, yeah, yeah, having that reference point. And that's, the reference point is 101, and then 102 developing out. And then we can, we can package this probably away now, but it's just, it's, yeah. it's, quite, it's quite cool. We finally were able to illustrate something on a, on a spectrum, but um, on a yeah. development spectrum. So feel, feel your own with subtlety, and then you notice your shifts based on external world, and then you, um, you notice the shifts uh, from other people, and then you deliberately and safely work with it, and then I wrote wow. helping other people with the ability, like holding Sounds space. Great. Sounds great. Sounds great. And then if we wanted to go to Four. 40, 402, we now Four, start working with um, non-human entities. Yeah. Entities, subtler energies, other layers of information. Um, subtler energies yeah and then i mean the dead honest i mean just stuff that's out there we might not necessarily believe in but that seems to show up regularly to people who seem to have a a, a capacity for it yeah um a um, lot of this and actually this is part of what um initially got me to the spectrum was just the ability to if we, if we believe that everything is connected, if we believe that the butterfly effect exists, if we believe that there is all fibers are connected of every atom, of every molecule, of every plank length, that then there is some sort of ability then to go from my toroidal form of energy into 
your toroidal form of energy through this interconnected web. Totally. Feeling not only your soul at this moment, but feeling, feeling across the earth to how China currently feels. I think this is very possible. Feeling how a dolphin currently feels swimming through that gorgeous ocean, jumping through the and enjoying that, feeling how that tree that's been alive for thousands of years feels as it's continuing to nourish that environment, get those resources from the soil and get the resources from the sunlight. Totally. How about how the dolphin feels when they're being slaughtered in that Japanese massacre every year? Do we, can we touch on that or? We can. Bring awareness we can. to that You just have. Slaughter. Yeah, there Over it is. Japan. The, slaughter the pain of the dolphin dolphins. being slaughtered is now present in this space. Yeah, the ta Taiji dolphin drive hunt. <sighs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Just, just for, just for a moment, because um, oh, we don't, we? we don't know how many people are, yeah, are aware of this, but <clears throat> government quota allows over two thousand to be slaughtered or captured. <clears throat> Annually, twenty-two thousand are killed. So, 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 yeah, why, why? Money. Why? Money. Go ahead, show the picture. Context Must and history. We, I would rather not look at a picture yeah, of Yeah, let's not do it on slotted. David's stream, but, um, but we just brought awareness to it. But that's, that's, yeah, that was our. I'm sorry, David. That's okay. My role is devil's advocate. And I appreciate your role. Okay, so I, that I'm was. I'm expressing my preference. Yes, yes, that was, okay, that was 401. And then, uh, we can just end there and then we'll 402, yeah. 402 has something to do with the way we engage with these entities maybe maximizing yeah and 402 would be something like um travel interdimensional travel or something like that we've now let, gone beyond my pay grade a little bit although yeah. i have flashes of this totally yeah all right beautiful <laughs> good job team we've made right. this and we will put this in the bio after the show as well I'm glad you guys got a chance to take a look at it, and I'm glad we got to make this. We, we'll be doing this more often on the show, integrating a note and then writing in it if we have uh, good thoughts to integrate. Okay, so uh, back to the, the Kickstarter page. Here we go. Awesome. And maybe we can, we can yes. tie a link, tie, make a link between what we just said and my own story. Uh, yeah which is that I went through my own much less linear process to go from this stuff, whatever this stuff is, isn't real. There's no underlying meaning to things. Information travels the way we expect. If you're making other claims, you're nuts or you're a fraud to not just learning to accept that some of these things are real, but actually realizing that I'm here as a vehicle for them. Yes. And then starting to do this work, which was and remains still a little bit embarrassing to me. Yes. Cuts yes. across some of my own narratives of self, um, like stumbling and bumbling my way from well-educated, typical Jewish skeptical type. Grew up in L.A., upper middle class, slightly academic backgrounds to somebody who does intuitive readings for a living and uh, teaches people about subtle realms. So that's yeah. a, that was a journey and that's a journey that my play uh, will take you on. Yes, good. And, and it's, it's m just for me personally, I find I get more joy out of bringing people along for the ride from I don't believe any of this stuff to Hmm, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Then I do bringing people from, I'm having all these experiences that are real, but I don't know what to do about them to, I feel now more grounded in that. I do a lot of that second kind of work all the time and I'm happy to do it, but where my heart is, is come on guys, let's go. Yeah, yeah. It's time, let's, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. wake up to these possibilities. Magic yeah. is real, look, yeah. I'm here, let's do it. And that's what the play is about. I'm really happy that you made the distinction there between uh, people that 
just completely discredit anything that doesn't have data that's subjective. Yeah. Um, and versus people that are getting so much of that data that they can't organize it and figure it, ground themselves with it. But um, I really like that. I, I also really enjoy, for me, a lot of it is like when someone goes, I don't care at all about biology. And then I'm like, it's the code of life. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then they're like, what do you, and then they're slowly <laughs> getting That's that. great. Yeah. We have yeah. the same, we have the same uh, I don't know, purpose in some sense. We're onboarding people or we're, we're, yeah. we're outreach for another way of looking at things. Yes. That's, that's where yes, my heart yes. is. I want to be, I want to be a billboard for another way of doing things. And I also yeah. want to make billboards for other ways of doing things in the literal sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I myself am working to be an emissary, a brand ambassador for this other world that we have a felt sense of, occasionally spy out there in the distance, dream about. I want to say, hey, it's already kind of here a little bit. Can you yeah. see it? Yeah. Um, and then when Ron says, but what about the dying dolphin? I'm like, I, let's integrate that. That's part of this world too. Yeah. I don't want to push anything aside. That's, yes. how, we, that's how we fall down by yeah. pushing aside. Let's, let's integrate, integrate it as well. Yeah and have open discourse about uh, moving away from practices that we find to be causing suffering on the planet. Or if we can do even better, bringing as much compassion and love to the causes of those sufferings or those people enacting that mm. cycle so that it just stops on its own instead of mm. blaming them for that yes, behavior. Yes, yes. What is the compulsion to massacre dolphins? If we truly understood that, we could heal it very easily. But if we say, well, the problem is that um, they're killing the dolphins, then we're like, okay, then we have to stop them from killing the dolphins. But then they go and kill the seals the next day. It's just, we, yeah, yeah. It's more it's, words. It's the, it's the process it's of the delivering underlying that love mechanism. to the roots, to yes. the roots, yeah. And, and allowing with as much compassion as we can muster, or those of us who have that compassion to show up for it, for the, for the blockages to this more beautiful world, to quote, um, to quote a, a writer I deeply admire, Charles Eisenstein, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible, that we are mm -hmm. all yep. either consciously or unconsciously working toward, even as we fight it. Yep. Let's, let's discuss this. This came up in our last mm -hmm. episode together, and you highlighted it, and I've loved watching it several mm -hmm. times now. The society has evolved to a point of a masculine energetic grip and there is a transitionary process of the feminine energy that is that is the masculine grip is that's feminine energy is coming in the masculine grip is slowly unraveling enough to where the feminine grip can also come and be present right. with it at the same time as harmony you really like that harmony idea I like a mess. Uh, I think I think I think this idea of balance or, or harmony is allows it to be safe for those of us who feel a need to still control things enough. So we're like, okay, we're going to find this place where I'm still represented in my need and desire to control things with information and thought and clarity. I'll still be safe there and there'll be space for this other thing I don't fully understand, but I know it's kind of an equal partner, sort of. Yeah, we'll figure it out together. It's a very comforting story, but I don't think it's the real one. Um. <laughs> well, you love this mess. Tell us about yeah, why. Yeah, I love the mess. Yeah, uh, I, I think the... Can mess and harmony live together? No. <laughs> but uh, 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 uh. <laughs> we're doing all right. Yeah. You're holding on. <laughs> what? what did he say? He said, did you say we do all right, Alan? Yeah, we yeah, do. you did. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. That's great. Oh, that's good. Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. No, but a mess is necessary for uh, eventual establishing of harmony. Uh, yes, uh, I think. Yes. So, it's it's not. So it's messy, it, but then it harmonizes. It's not up. It's. Yeah, we can make this a little bit more concrete. Let's say you run some kind of organization that's extremely data-driven and hyper-rational, and you don't believe 
as I've heard in so many boardrooms, if we don't measure it, it doesn't count. This is, yeah. your, this is your principle. If we don't measure it, it doesn't count. If we can't put a number to it, it doesn't matter. This is the Dangerous. operating system, but this is the operating system of most, most organizations in the world today. Yeah. It's good, but it's also like, can be dangerous in many ways. It's like someone comes in with an emotion or feeling, it's like, yo, we can't measure that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or they say, okay, if you're gonna bring something other than what we can measure into this space because we have some sense, we're feeling enough pressure to care about, oh, meditation, even if we can't prove that it's worth something, we're gonna let everyone meditate for 10 minutes a day because it's trendy <laughs> and we wanna be seen as cool. Even though we can't measure the value of cool, we're a little afraid of being seen as uncool, so we're gonna do it but we're gonna need you to prove the value of this meditation to the bottom line. To the so, bottom line, yeah. So they make all these people <laughs> who are bringing something new in subjugate themselves to the tyranny of what can be measured. Okay, let's say you bring in a violinist on Friday when everybody's right. hanging out. Do you need to quantify that with the bottom line or do you just intuitively know that somebody that's playing the violin or the trumpet is? So think is, about what happens if, here's what I'm saying, that this, this harmony you're thinking about is, is is, is a comforting illusion. Um, <laughs> because when you start to go open up to this violinist, you bring in this violinist and there's an energy that shifts in, and suddenly what happens if people are really open to the transformative power of art is they start to prioritize things that can't be measured more. Mm -hmm. It's not that you start measuring those things that can't be measured, that's holding on you start shifting and you go, wait, wait, wait a second. My heart is opening to this music. When I go back to my cubicle and I figure out how to extract more money from customers, my heart is closing. Or provide more value to customers because it doesn't have to be that negative. It doesn't approach. have to yeah. be, you're yeah. right. Yeah. That's my bias. Yeah. Um, even, but I'm providing more value. But I'm at a distance, like there's, when you start to let in that, that amorphous stuff that is the beauty of life as we all experience it, it wants to take over because we want to live that way. We want to live in connection, in love, in joy, in excitement. Not in cubicles. We don't want to live, we just don't want to live as slaves to numbers. We just don't want to do it. That's what AI's job is for. Maybe that's what AI's job is for. Um, yeah, maybe that's what they have to this for. Uh, so that's, it, start, it just gets messy. Like, yes, there is a balance to be had, but the balance is in, comes after we prioritize the subjective, comes after we prioritize what wants to happen, what our hearts are longing for. So I, I used to go crazy because I would um, uh, go into any kind of meeting and you say, this is the underlying truth that wants to be, known or seen and I felt deeply connected to something and they would say prove it and then you'd go through this song and dance to prove it and you felt like in the proving of it you were killing it. This is true of every, every nonprofit deals with this problem. Every nonprofit that's motivated from the heart is like, oh, we're doing this amazing thing. We know it in our bones. We're so drawn to it. And then they go to a funder and the funder sits back and says, can you prove to me the ROI? Can you prove to me the value? And then the, then, the, then the nonprofit has to go through this whole long song and dance about the underlying value that can be reduced to numbers and then deliver it on a platform to this funder who then says, oh, this makes a lot of sense. But we know in the process that something is just dying. The life of the project has been killed through this process. And it's rare is the person running that nonprofit who can hold both the underlying meaning of what they're doing and tell the BS story about its measurable value to people who are gonna finance it in his or her mind, heart at the same time. So usually there's okay. this split. Yes, you're illustrating something very important, but I also want to see if it can, if it can actually harmonize through the mess. So the, in this exact <clears throat> depiction that you've illustrated, we could have a person that is roaring with their heart and their soul on a nonprofit project. Meanwhile, at the same time, there is AI or engineers that are working with the actual data that exists from the value that they're providing other people. And they're just simply measuring it 
and seeing what methods of disseminating the information yeah. can maximize the value. So anyway, I agree. They can exist but and what's the what's the? It's a, I guess the difference is whether you're oriented around a goal, which is almost inevitably going to be reductionist, or whether you're oriented around a process, which is open. So if you're oriented, if you if you're like I want to. Goals can be open too. Thank you, Ronnie, for the timer. Let's okay. Let's okay. Let, let's jump into the couple okay. other things that we wanted to talk Sounds about. Sounds good. Um, I I think this has been something that we've talked about on the show quite a bit. About you know we've had Rack Rasm on the show talking about uh, five MeO DMT. He's we've great. had Michael Pollan talking about psychedelics These and guys how are to, great. how to change your mind. So. What does psychedelics have to do with empathy? Everything? <laughs> uh, well, these are like two of my greatest favorite themes <laughs> crossing, so I could go on forever. Uh, but let me see if I can summarize. Psychedelics show us that we are interconnected. They don't just show us conceptually. They give us the experience of that sense of interconnectedness. Sometimes they give us the experience, 5MEO DMT does, of there not even being an I to be interconnected. We are nothing but the interconnectivity. Mm -hmm. And empathy is nothing more than the recognition that there's not a meaningful separation between you and me. Yeah, yeah there you have it. Yeah, that was boiled down quite well. So, all right, let's 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 keep unpacking this intersection because there's there's so much more nuance to it. So, let's talk about how we have an event coming up with psychedelic seminars on microdosing with Ayelet Wallman and Jim Fadim. And tickets are still available. Go to simulationseries.com for those tickets, October twenty second. So, let's talk about how those small sort of microdoses into psychedelics begin the process of enabling 101, 102, 201, 202 to slowly amplify, to make it easier to open up oh, the heart. It's true that I know very little about microdosing. Uh, my what approach, you, been, my <laughs> approach has, been, has been macro dosing. Uh, I think there's probably a lot of people who are micro dosing because they want to open themselves up and are afraid to quote unquote go for it. And if microdosing makes you feel safe and secure on your journey, wonderful. But the truth is when I've microdosed, I get this little feeling of like, yeah, this is a nice little snack, but take me there. Uh, I, I tend to agree with you. That's not to disparage microdosers. <clears throat> truth, I tend to agree with you. But, but basically a lot of this conversation on microdosing is really about the power of psychedelics with a little on-ramp for people too afraid to go into them fully. And I appreciate your fear, and your fear might be very well placed. Maybe microdosing is a great on-ramp. However, I'm a big fan of, um, of going for it. There's That's also been my a journey. lot of, yeah, safety and security needs to be there, the proper environment. Yeah, let's proper, all say that, you know, yeah. I mean, I can't yeah. say that, blah, blah, blah. I, yeah. That's actually truly important. David, you seem like somebody that's had phenomenal psychedelic experiences and I have as well and the thing about our experiences is that they are going to be completely snowflaked in terms of difference from others and so somebody else doesn't have necessarily the yeah but you know I'll tell you what 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 great perfect look, experience. I agree like please everyone be careful with psychedelics that's what we're it really about matters who you're taking them with it really matters where you're taking them it really matters the quality but my God, be careful with Zoloft and Prozac and lithium and Valium and methadone and all of these poisons. True. And some of them are not poisons. Some of them are real lifesavers. I don't mean to disparage people taking, taking antidepressants if it's, if it's really helping you okay. You get addicted but, to alcohol but, or pharmaceuticals or but tobacco. Adderall yeah. and caffeine and all of these yeah. things that, that change our nervous system in ways we don't fully understand that we're not being told to be careful about and things that That's open right. us wide open to the magical possibilities of the universe, we have to do, you know, tap dance around it and be like, oh, it's going to be fun. It's going, it's just, it's just MDMA, you need a safe environment and this and that. And it's like, meanwhile, people 
drink and drive like it's nothing. Yeah. And, you know, so I'm like, hey, uh, how about we put some of those uh, seat belts on around all the stuff we do that's toxic and dangerous in day-to-day -day life and loosen this narrative around the importance of being careful in a place that is fundamentally beautiful and heart-affirming and infinite. That was so well said. I love it. Love it. Get more people aware about the consequences of the alcohol and the caffeine and the tobacco and the other pharmaceutical addictions and then loosen up the restraints a bit on the psychedelics, but also be careful. Okay, good stuff. Um, I wanted to yeah. see what you would say because, you know, you do blast off in psychedelic world. Me too. Uh, let's just at least touch on what exactly that does to one's ability, because you did mention, mm. you gave these examples, and they were really good about the intersection of yeah. pain psychedelics. But let's, let's pierce this the way that, let's just give an example, especially with you, when you're sitting here across from somebody and you're feeling what they're feeling, what has psychedelics done to get you closer into feeling what they're feeling? Uh, ayahuasca was huge for me. Ayahuasca taught me that I was carrying other people's feelings in my body and showed me how to release them. Whoa. Ayahuasca took me on the journey from, hey, a lot of what is quote unquote wrong with you or a lot of what's holding you back isn't even yours. I'm gonna show that to you. And then I'm gonna give you these tools to let go of that stuff. And then once I'd done that or a lot of that, then when I was sitting across from someone, even socially, I was so much more sensitive to what my experience was of their experience. And because I was independent of all these psychedelics, relatively articulate, I would be able to put words to it. And then uh, from that, this, this career has sort of taken off, started to take off on the runway of taking um, off, who yeah. knows. Um, ayahuasca, so yeah. interesting. So ayahuasca was the big, Whoa. big opener. And uh, then that, that helped you understand what within you was holding you back that you were carrying that wasn't even yours. Yeah. And then you kind of were able to, you know, package that, integrate it, package it away. Yeah, so very concretely, like uh, I talk about this in my play, um, show this in the play. So ayahuasca, the first time I did ayahuasca, um, I wanted like great wisdom to come down. You know, show me what I need to know. And the ayahuasca didn't have much wisdom for me in the conventional sense, but it took me into my body and I was tensing and releasing and tensing and releasing and writhing and on the floor. Mm -hmm. And what it was showing me was that I was carrying all this stuff in my body that needed just to be physically released. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was a conceptual issue was actually a, 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 in my muscles. And, uh, and then it kept showing me images of other people. Uh, whether it was somebody very close to me or just some guy I met at a coffee shop that I'd absorbed their energy. And it showed me how to release that. And oh, I felt so much lighter after that. And from that place of lightness, I've been able to do this work. Yes. Wow, okay. Man, just, I'm feeling you describe this and I'm feeling you advance, level up by Ayahuasca has it. leveled me up. Um, and I wonder, sure. I wonder how else, you know, we gave this 101 to 402 thing that we made. And it's just, it's cool that there are these processes that we can help disseminate and teach and psychedelics that have been around for thousands of years, this practice of, of, of empathy that's been around since we evolved, since as we've been evolving that, of just getting more into our bodies and more into feeling and energy and emotion. So, okay, let's, let's talk about this on the way out just because you, you brought this up. I thought it was really important. The sort of societal pressures that we face that prevent us from self-actualization, there's these societal pressures of this is what you should be, this is what, how you should act, this is all of these different should, should, shoulds. These are all these ideal scenarios that you could potentially be and whatnot. And then there is the self that's having its own experience that wants to heal, that wants to integrate its trauma, that wants to explore its own self path. So teach us about this. Well, that was beautifully said. You did a great job summarizing it. What we were talking about is what is at the core of everything I'm talking about, what I deeply believe and what I'm working to bring out into this world 
along with many other people, is the idea that we all have within us this fundamental self that's different person to person. You are not the same as me. We are different. And my job or purpose is to allow that essential me out into its full expression here on this planet. And there are two ways to go about doing that. One is, let's call it healing, which is working through whatever is blocking the expression of that self, whether that's the stuff in the past or dynamics in the present that could be clarified. Um, and the other is through following one's bliss, going where one is excited to go, seeing what's happening and going, whoa, cool, and going there. Uh, through these two parallel processes, some underlying deeper self naturally emerges. This is the meta-narrative underneath all of my work. And I recognize that this narrative is antithetical to our cultural narrative. So our cultural narrative is constantly telling us that there is an ideal that we should strive for, or maybe different sets of ideals. For a man, the ideal is a successful, wealthy father with, who cares about a lot of people. That's sort of like the apex, hypothetically. Uh, women are taught all sorts of different narratives from being a sexy 20-year-old to being a mother in her 30s to being this nurturing, loving person. These are all these different ideals that we get saddled with that operate independent of who we as individuals really are. Yes. Um, and I want a world where we are encouraged, where the culture is pushing us or supporting us to unfold who we are instead of constantly selling us these ideals that tell us we're falling short. Yeah, yeah. Some aspects to the culture that we live in are, yes, they're really heavy pressures in a lot of ways and they, they actually vector us away from that soul blueprint mm -hmm. that we have. There are other ones that are interesting that are, you know, it's like find meaning in life by taking on responsibility and, and also make some sort of impact, make the world better than where, when you arrived in it. And so maybe there are other ones like that that are those cultural pressures that I'm like, good. Like, those are cool. And I think they match with almost everyone's soul blueprint. Do they? Meaning. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I went to... I remember going to um, yeah, do they. fancy high school and there was all this pressure around community service. You got to do your community service. You need to do 16 hours of community service. And people would just go through the motions of doing community service because it didn't feel true to them. And I'm not sure that making peanut butter sandwiches for homeless people thinking it was stupid did anything for anybody. Um, There's a variety of ways to perform community service. But even that... A trillion ways but, to do but, so. you know, like... And I'm, the service to the community is a natural, the desire yes. to do it happens naturally if we feel resourced and full. Whereas if we're doing it because our ego says a good person does it, or we're doing it because True. there's a pressure to do it and we should be ashamed if we don't care about other people, that underlying re resistance or resentment will find its expression in other ways and I'm not sure ultimately it's of more service than for that person who says, you know what, I don't give a damn about other people. I just care about me. There's a lot of shame for somebody who, who feels that way, but I would rather a world where they can say that and own that than a world where they have to hide that. Because if they can say that sure. and own that, we can work with that. But if they, have, if they get to hide that because they make contributions to charity, then we're all living in delusional land. Let's give another example that could be maybe potentially be more awakening on the, on the way out. Just this example of if the opportunity, the resource, the tool is available to go and see what the lowest socioeconomic status lives like and be able to go and serve them for a period of a day or however long you choose to do that, then there's another resource or tool which is the ability to go and 
get a tour of a waste facility to be able to see how garbage and recycling and composting or septic systems or slaughterhouses or these different systems, how they actually perform, go for a day. Just for the tools to be made available so that people can choose to go and explore them, that way we can have a more objective sort of reason driven, ethics driven, morals driven way of driving civilization forward because these tools are made available just for people to be able to choose. Not that everybody mm. needs to be pressured, mm. but just so that they are available to choose. Well, I, I think we can, we can have just to allow for a little disagreement in worldviews. Um, I probably want the world you're envisioning that you believe these things will, will move people toward. I don't believe that that process you're describing, go check this out, go check that out, if, is what... If it's inclined, if you're yeah, inclined. Yeah, so, so then the underlying thing that I'm interested in is what is your actual experience of your life as it is right now and where is that pulling you toward, honestly? And if you're lost and you have no idea, can you own being lost? Can you own that you have no idea and see what wants to emerge through that confusion? And if you do have this impulse, you're like, I'm drawn to the soil, I'm drawn to the water, I'm drawn to the trees, I'm drawn, well then, by all means, please, yes. God, follow it. Yes. But don't follow it because you feel like a good person would be, would be drawn there. Follow it because you are drawn there. And if you're following it because you think a good person would be drawn there, leave that space for the good people who are naturally drawn there. Yes, David, yes. So, okay, let's wrap up. I um, want to see if you have a... Uh, any change in how you feel about the mm. question of what you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? What I think is the most beautiful thing in the world? What do I think is the most beautiful thing in the world? You mean, what do you mean by change in the question? Because I think I asked you it last time. Oh, I'm curious what I, don't tell me what I answered. Let's you, see, I'll answer it new. Because I completely fresh, forgot. Fresh, yeah, fresh from a couple months now. Infinite potential is what's coming to me. Mm. I love it, and why? I get this feeling of awe around it and humility, like the, the pleasant kind of humility where you're like, oh my God, I'm just nothing in this great mystery. It feels really good to be nothing. And with that, this feeling of, well, I'm also part of this great mystery. Um, mm -hmm. That's what comes to me. Beautiful. Um, can, I, can I wrap by saying, um, I'm really needing support right now. If you're moved by what I'm up to in this world, um, I would love your help with this play. It's how I'm feeling called to express what's going through me right now. And it's the first step on a longer series of outputs around what it is to be an empath and helping people come into their own experience of subtle realms. So if that moves you, please go to my website, empath.nyc, and find my Kickstarter through there or click on Alan's link to the Kickstarter. I really appreciate it. Please support artists, creators, builders, people that are manifesting their soul blueprints into the world like Oof, David. Support him, support us, we need your help. And together, we will build a beautiful future. David, thank, thank you, you Alan. so much for coming on the show. It's so, such a pleasure, I love it. It's fun to be here. This, this was so much fun, uh, this was so much fun. Ron, for the producing and directing, huge thank you. Everyone, give us a comment below. Let us know your thoughts. We would love to hear from you. Let us know your feels. We'd love to hear from you. Also, go and create, go and build, go manifest your destiny into the world. Go do it, go execute. And support David, support the play that's coming in New York City, November 29th. Got it. Through December 8th. December 9th. Just through December 9th. So, Go and support him. Much love, everyone. Thank you, and we will see you soon. Peace.